Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol will be in order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. Pursuant to House Deposition Authority Regulation 10, the chair announces the committee's approval to release the deposition material presented during this hearing. Good afternoon. In our hearings over the previous weeks, the Select Committee has laid out the details of the multi-party pressure campaign driven by the former president aimed at overturning the results of the 2020 presidential elections and blocking the transfer of power. It's shown that this effort is based on a lie, a lie that the election was stolen, painted by widespread fraud. failed to take meaningful action to quell the violence as it was unfolding on January 6th. However, in recent days, the Select Committee has obtained new information dealing with what was going on in the White House on January 6th and in the days prior. Specific detailed information about what the former president and his top aides were doing and saying in those critical hours. First-hand details of what transpired in the office of the White House Chief of Staff, just steps from the Oval Office as the threats of violence became clear, and indeed, violence ultimately descended on the Capitol in the attack on American democracy. It's, an important, it's important that the American people hear that information immediately. That's why, in consultation with the Vice Chair, I recall the committee for today's hearing. As you've seen and heard in our earlier hearings, the Select Committee has developed a massive body of evidence thanks to the many hundreds of witnesses who have voluntarily provided information relevant to our investigation. It hasn't always been easy to get that information because the same people who drove the former president's pressure campaign to overturn the election are now trying to cover up the truth about January 6th. But thanks to the courage of certain individuals, the truth won't be buried. The American people won't be left in the dark. Our witness today is Cassie Hutchinson, has embodied that courage. I won't get into a lot of detail about Ms. Hutchinson's testimony. We'll show. I'll allow her words to speak for themselves. And I hope everyone at home will listen very closely. First, I recognize our distinguished vice chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, for any opening statement she care to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In our first five hearings, the committee has heard from a significant number of Republicans, including former Trump administration Justice Department officials, Trump campaign officials, several members of President Trump's White House staff, prominent conservative judge, and several others. Today's witness, Ms. Cassidy Hutchinson is another Republican and another former member of President Trump's White House staff. Certain of us in the House of Representatives recall that Ms. Hutchinson once worked for House Republican Whip Steve Scalise, but she is also a familiar face on Capitol Hill because she held a prominent role in the White House Legislative Affairs Office and later was the principal aide to President Trump's Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. Ms. Hutchinson has spent considerable time up here on Capitol Hill representing the Trump administration, and we welcome her back. Up until now, our hearings have each been organized to address specific elements of President Trump's plan to overturn the 2020 election. Today, we are departing somewhat from that model because Ms. Hutchinson's testimony touches on several important and cross-cutting topics, topics that are relevant to each of our future hearings. In her role working for the White House Chief of Staff, Ms. Hutchinson handled a vast number of sensitive issues. She worked in the West Wing, several steps down the hall from the Oval Office. Ms. Hutchinson spoke daily with members of Congress, with high-ranking officials in the administration, with senior White House staff, including Mr. Meadows. 
with White House counsel, lawyers, and with Mr. Tony Ornato, who served as the White House Deputy Chief of Staff. She also worked on a daily basis with members of the Secret Service who were posted in the White House. In short, Ms. Hutchinson was in a position to know a great deal about the happenings in the Trump White House. Ms. Hutchinson has already sat for four videotaped interviews with committee investigators, and we thank her very much for her cooperation and for her courage. We will cover certain, but not all, relevant topics within Ms. Hutchinson's knowledge today. Again, our future hearings will supply greater detail, putting the testimony today in a broader and more complete context. Today, you will hear Ms. Hutchinson relate certain firsthand observations of President Trump's conduct on January 6th. You will also hear new information regarding the actions and statements of Mr. Trump's senior advisors that day, including his Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, and his White House counsel. And we will begin to examine evidence bearing on what President Trump and members of the White House staff knew about the prospect for violence on January 6th, even before that violence began. To best communicate the information the committee has gathered, we will follow the practice of our recent hearings, playing videotape testimony from Ms. Hutchinson and others, and also posing questions to Ms. Hutchinson live. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Our witness today is Ms. Cassie Hutchinson, who served in the Trump administration in the White House Office of Legislative Affairs from 2019 to 2020 and as a special assistant to the president in the White House Chief of Staff's office from March 2020 through January 2021. I will now swear in our witness. The witness will please stand and raise her Do it! Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Thank you. You may be seated. The record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. I now recognize myself for questions. Ms. Hutchinson, I'd like to start with a few questions about your background. These, they, these are some photographs Time we've obtained highlighting your career. We truly are. As cosmic beings, these yeah. show you with members of Congress, including Steve Scalise, as well as the White House with leader Kevin McCarthy and Jim Jordan. Others show you with the president and members of Congress aboard Air Force One. Before you worked in the White House, you worked on Capitol Hill for Representative Steve Scalise, the Republican whip, and Senator Ted Cruz. And then in 2019, you moved to the White House and served there until the end of the Trump administration in 2020. When you started at the White House, you served at, in the Office of Legislative Affairs. We understand that you Principal aid.
able to do that day. So is it fair to say that you spoke regularly in your position, both with members of Congress and with senior members of the Trump administration? That's correct, that's a fair assessment, sir. And would you say that in your work with Mr. Meadows, you were typically in contact with him and others in the White House throughout the day? That's correct, sir. Mr. Meadows and I were in contact almost pretty much throughout the, every day, um, consistently. Although so much of grave importance happens in the West Wing of the White House, it's a quite a small building. Uh, above me on the screen, you can see a map of the first floor of the West Wing of the White House. On the right, you can see the President's Oval Office. On the left, the Chief of Staff's Office Suite. Within the Chief of Staff's office suite is the heart of the West Wing, was your desk, which was between the Vice President's office, Ms. Kirshner's office, and the Oval Office. Ms. Hutchinson, is this an accurate depiction of where you were located? It's accurate. It's a lot smaller than it looks. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, this is a photo that shows the short distance between your office and the president's Oval Office. And it only takes five to 10 seconds or so to walk down the hall from your office to the Oval Office. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Pursuant to the Section 5C8 of House Resolution 503, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we uh, will begin today with an exchange that first provided Ms. Hutchinson a tangible sense of the ongoing planning for the events of January 6th. On January 2nd, four days before the attack on our Capitol, President Trump's lead lawyer, Mr. Giuliani, was meeting with White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and others. Ms. Hutchinson, do you remember Mr. Giuliani meeting with Mr. Meadows on January 2nd, 2021? I do. He met with Mr. Meadows in the evening of January 2nd, 2021. And we understand that you walked Mr. Giuliani out of the White House that night, um, and he talked to you about January 6th. What do you remember him saying? As Mr. Giuliani and I were walking to his vehicles that evening, he looked at me and said something to the effect of, Pastor, are you excited? The 6th is going to be a great day. I remember him saying, Rudy, you explained what's happening on the 6th. Uh, he had responded to the effect of, we're going to the Capitol, it's going to be great, the President's going to be there, he's going to look powerful, he's, he's going to be with the members, he's going to be with the Senators. Talk to the Chief about it, talk to the Chief about it, he knows about it. And did you go back uh, then up to the West Wing and tell Mr. Meadows about your conversation with Mr. Giuliani? I did. After Mr. Giuliani had left the campus that evening, I went back up to our office and I found Mr. Meadows in his office on the couch. He was scrolling through his phone. I remember leaning against the doorway and saying, I had an interesting conversation with Rudy, Mark. It sounds like we're going to go to the Capitol. He didn't look up from his phone and said something to the effect of, there's a lot going on, Cass, but I don't know. Things might get real, real bad on January 6th. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, Mr. Meadows is engaged in litigation with the committee to try to avoid testifying here. Um, what, what was your reaction when he said to you things might get real, real bad? In the days before January 2nd, I was apprehensive about the 6th. I had heard general plans for a rally. Uh, I had heard tentative movements to potentially go to the Capitol. But when hearing Rudy's on January 6th and then Mark's response that was the first that evening was the first moment that I remember feeling scared and nervous for what could happen on January 6th and I had a deeper concern for what was happening with the planning aspects of it thank you Ms. Edgerson today we're going to be focusing primarily on the events of January 5th and six at the White House. 
uh, but to begin and to frame the discussion, I want to uh, talk about a conversation that you had, Mr. John Ratcliffe, the Director of National Intelligence, and uh, you had this conversation in December of 2020. Mr. Ratcliffe was nominated by President Trump uh, to oversee U.S. intelligence, uh, our U.S. intelligence community. Uh, and before his appointment, Mr. Ratcliffe was a Republican member of Congress. As you will see on this clip, Director Ratcliffe's comments in December of 2020 were prescient. My understanding was Mr. Rat Director Ratcliffe didn't want much to do with the post-election period. Director Ratcliffe felt that it wasn't something that the White House should be pursuing. It felt it was dangerous for the president's legacy. He had expressed to me that he was concerned that it could spiral out of control and potentially be dangerous, either in, for our democracy or the way that things were going for the six. We say it wasn't something the White House should be pursuing once he did. Trying to fight the results of the election, finding missing ballots, pressuring filing lawsuits in certain states where there didn't seem to be significant ev evidence and reaching out to state legislatures about that. So pretty much the way that the White House is handling the post-election period, he felt that there could be dangerous repercussions in terms of precedent set for elections, for our democracy, for the six, you know, he was hoping that we would concede. So Ms. Hutchinson, uh, now we're going to turn to certain information that was available before January 4th and what the Trump administration and the president knew about the potential for violence before January 6th. On the screen, you will see an email received by Acting Deputy Attorney General Donahue on January 4th from the National Security Division of the Department of Justice. Mr. Donahue testified in our hearings last week the email identifies apparent planning by those coming to Washington on January 6th to, quote, occupy federal buildings and discussions of, quote, invading the Capitol building. Here's what Mr. Donahue said to us. And we knew that if you have tens of thousands of very upset um, people showing up in Washington, so. D.C., that there was potential. Not as a stranger in the world. U.S. Secret Service was looking uh, at similar information and watching the planned demonstrations. In fact, their intelligence division sent several emails to White House personnel, like Deputy Chief of Staff Tony Ornato and the head of the President's Protective Detail, Robert Engel, including certain materials listing events like those on the screen. The White House continued to receive updates about planned demonstrations, including information regarding the Proud Boys organizing and planning to attend events on January 6th. Although Ms. Hutchinson has no detailed knowledge of any planning involving the Proud Boys for January 6th, she did note this. I recall hearing the word Oathkeeper and hearing the word Proud Boys closer to the planning of the January 6th rally when Mr. Giuliani would be around. On January 3rd, the Capitol Police issued a special event assessment. In that document, the Capitol Police noted that the Proud Boys and other groups planned to be in Washington, D.C. on January 6th and indicated that, quote, unlike previous post-election protests, the targets of the pro-Trump supporters are not necessarily the counter-protesters as they were previously, but rather Congress itself is the target on the 6th. Of course, we all know now that the Proud Boys showed up on January 6th, marched from the Washington Monument to the Capitol that day, and led the riotous mob to invade and occupy our Capitol. 